All right. So we're going to jump right back in and start talking about uh, substitution reactions some more today. Um, basically, so we've, we've covered the simplest mechanism, right? The, the concerted mechanism where everything happens at once makes a lot of sense as to why things are, are reactive and what's going on in terms of orbitals. Um, and it means that we have a pretty basic, we can, we can apply a sort of our fundamental rules of OCHEM and electronegativity and everything and get a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. Um, so SN2 is sort of, there's, that's the reason why it's the first reaction that we cover in depth in this class is because it's not that complicated, frankly. Things mostly get complicated when we start having competing reactions or, or multi-step reactions. Um, so just to review and go back to the thinking, get back to thinking about SN2 reactions, um, when they were first figuring out this mechanism, uh, the chemists discovered that reaction rates are inversely proportional to the stability of a carbocation in the same position as the leaving group. Which, if we remember our rules for carbocation stability, carbocations were the most stable when they were as substituted as possible, right? When you had most carbons around them or were stable, stabilized by resonance, um, but we'll get into resonance later. So just in terms of the rate of reaction, which of these molecules would we expect to be the most reactive according to SN2? The methyl chloride. And then we have two that are this. Oh, no, never mind. The bromide versus the chloride. Out of the bromide versus the chloride, which would we expect to be a better, a more reactive molecule? Yeah, in general, as you go down the periodic table in those halogens, the bigger they are, the better leaving group they are. And also the stronger acid, the conjugate acid is, right? So hydroionic acid is stronger than hydrobromic, which is stronger than hydrochloric. Um, and so the same trend holds for leaving groups. The bromide is a better leaving group than the chloride. Your whole last so, lecture just kicked me in the face as you asked that question. <laughs> got one back to those PKA tables in your head, right? Yeah. Um, so then, and then we would expect this to be our least reactive, right? Um, we kind of have two competing variables here a little bit in that bromide is a better leaving group than chloride, but this chloride has the least steric hindrance, right? So out of these two, they're both going to be, these are going to be one and two for sure. The question is, which is which is going to be, depend a little bit on the exact conditions. We could probably tweak the conditions or the nucleophile um, to where sterics became more important than how, how good of a leaving group it was. If we had a, a nucleophile that was a very big, bulky nucleophile, then this one's going to react faster. But if our nucleophile is small, then, then maybe the sterics are going to matter a little bit less. And the fact that bromide's a better leaving group might take over. And right? so we still kind of have these competing variables. And that's going to be a common theme um, for the rest of this class, frankly. Is, is, and it's kind of the root of why I hate to, to use absolutes, is because there's almost always something else going on that we could tweak to change things yeah. or to find an exception. Um, but and now, now we all know enough chemistry to where we can actually start getting into the nitty gritty of those details as opposed to, well, here's the general rule and just don't ask me about the exceptions yet. Um, so here's some, some numbers. This, these are all with bromide. So we have the same leaving group. So we're only looking at one variable at a time. 
Um, and if we look at a lot of times we see this in organic chemistry, they won't put an absolute number to the rates because the absolute number to the rates is going to depend on a lot of things like concentration, side reactions, temperature. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll do it in relative rates. So they basically just will say, okay, this reaction we're calling our standard. We're going to compare every other rate to this one. So, and that, that kind of gets around the fact that even like different chemical suppliers are going to have different impurities um, and that might affect rates or, you know, very slightly different impurities in the solvents, that kind of thing. Um, so this way is a way of making it universal to everybody. And so we do see that with, um, with the sterics, the larger the group bar is, the, the larger the groups are and the more of them that you have attached to the active carbon, the slower the reaction goes. Um, it's presented sort of backwards compared to that because it has it written as, um, with this is our, is our standard reaction is a secondary carbon. If it's a primary carbon with a propyl group or with an ethyl group attached to the primary carbon. So it's a propane, that'd be bromo, pro, one bromopropane. The active carbon has two carbons attached to it. So we call that an ethyl group attached to, to the primary carbon, to the active carbon. That's 16 times faster. And if it's just a methyl group instead of an ethyl group, 40 times faster. And if you go all the way to a methyl carbon, 1,200 times faster. Right? Because we have those exponential relationships, you have small differences in terms of activation energy or in terms of that pre-Iranius or that uh, pre-exponential factor wind up having a really big impact on measurable rates to the point where if it's a tertiary group, can effectively just say it doesn't happen. We know that statistically speaking, there is some amount of it that might happen, but it happens too slowly to measure. This is basically the chemist's way of saying, well, yeah, but not really. Within sig figs, we can say it doesn't happen. Um, so at room temperature, and this is the other thing that, that um, you relative rate gets away from is it means that the the room temperature that doesn't have to be defined at all to say what temperature the reaction is happening at. We're just assuming that all of these are happening at the same temperature. So would we expect to see this reaction happen? Not have to measure. Not have to measure. <laughs> right? So we would normally say if we were looking at this, we would just say, we just say NR. Go back to your gen cam, right? That for precipitation reactions, we always said if we didn't mix something that precipitates out, we said no, no reaction. The trick with that though is that that reaction actually happens pretty quickly. But when they tested the rate law, they found that the rate law. was only dependent on your the rate of your halo alkane. So like I said, obviously it's a different me mechanism from SN2 because everything we've said about SN2 would indicate this shouldn't happen. So what was our other option as far as um, substitution reactions? Remember, we kind of went through two possibilities, right? Stepwise, SN2. Stepwise, SN1, single step, or sorry, this is where I try not to say this number of steps, right? right. SN1 is first order reaction because it's a multi-step process. And what would the first step be? Bromine leaves is leaving group, right? See, it's the, the nice thing about SN1 versus SN2 is it's the same exact reaction or mechanism steps, they just either happen at the same time or one after the other. So base, so what will happen, what are we left with after bromide leaves? Or carbocation. And that kind of helps under, helps us understand why this happens relatively quickly is because what do we know about 
carbocation stability. It's not that stable, but um, the more stable or the more substituted that active carbon is, the more stable the carbocation is going to be, right? So it all, it's basically the exact inverse of SN2. SN2 gets faster the less sterics you have around, but SN1 gets faster the more sterics you have around, not because of the sterics, but because you have those carbons that can donate electrons. And then that leaves a nice big target, essentially, for anything with a pair of lone or a lone pair of electrons can come in and form a new bond there and fill that that valence. So that would be the final result after the second step. So after the nucleophile attacks, first step leaving group leaves, second step nucleophile attacks. And then we get a second intermediate that's going to look like look like this. And then when we run out of the condensed structure way of showing you've got a bunch of metals attached is to right CH three three. So since they're all the same thing that's attached, we can just write it a lot smaller that way. So then the last step. <clears throat> And the reason you wind up with HBr as product is because we're going to do a quick proton transfer just with whatever is around. It doesn't actually have to be the bromide. Basically, take that extra proton away. Just because we don't typically leave a final product that has a charge that's that, that unstable. So this is... This product, is, it would be considered the end of the SN1 part. And then the proton transfer is basically just cleaning things up. Would it be incorrect to say that you're protonating that you're protonating? No, you just switch your frame of reference, right? Just like in physics, all that it really takes is as your frame of reference, the train, or is it is it the car driving next to the train as when it comes to de determining relative speeds, right? Yeah. Usually, our frame of reference is the organic molecule. So we talk about the bromide acting as the base, but we can definitely say, and this acts as the acid to the bromide. It's not incorrect. It's just switched. Yeah, who does that? So we already kind of did this. Um, so with larger groups or groups that. It's always interesting as a as a teacher because different, even the same size classes will have wildly different preparation or like certain concepts hit better for some groups. So we've already basically done this because something about the way we've got we've led up to this made it really obvious. You know. Um, and so that's the effectively, if we're writing out the whole mechanism showing our work. we would just go through and make sure you're showing the electrons moving, not the nuclei. And it can be really helpful to know where you're trying to go. So sometimes with these mechanisms, a lot of times they'll just be given to you like this, but, but writing out what the product is first gets, gets you halfway there because then you know what your end goal is. One of the trickiest things about organic chemistry is to try and work out a mechanism without knowing what the product is going to be. Um, you can do it, but it's really, really hard. And there's a lot of things you can miss along the way. Um, probably the single, I think it was the single worst test score I ever got on a chemistry test was um, my second midterm. So we did two midterms in a final and a semester class for OCHEM 1. My second midterm, I thought I understood mechanisms. Well enough that I could just reason my way through them and I didn't have to memorize things anywhere anymore. And I definitely didn't know things well enough to do that. Um, so it, when in doubt, fill in your product first. Since But we had that on the last slide, so I'm not going to rewrite it here. First step, leaving group leaves. Rewrite your new 
your new molecules. Now we've got a vacant spot. The other thing to remember about those carbocations, that's in not just a positive charge, it's incomplete valence, right? So that means it's really easy to bring in a lone pair, have it make a new sigma bond. Then, like I said on the last one, our final step is just you have to have something around to pull an X to accept the extra H plus. Um, since we tend to like to write balanced overall reactions, we use bromide as the as our um, base in this case. But if there's water around, it's actually probably more accurate to say that water is going to accept the extra H plus, right? Because water is a better base than bromide is, which is what makes hydrobromic acid a strong acid. Water is that 100% of the bromides give away their H plus to water. So if you have water around, you'll likely actually have that act as the base. But in the interest of making it a balanced <clears throat> reaction, Get our final products. It does get messy, and this is also one of the reasons. Like on the um, on the midterm, um, you wind up with them. They don't always go left to right because sometimes when you have a mechanism that needs multiple step or multiple lines, rather than stop it here and then rewrite everything over here, it's easier to just go down and then snake it back down around the other way. Um, if you wanted to write every mechanism step as its own reaction, that's not wrong. It's just going to be extra writing. So with the Romeo here is the third, it would be the second step. Yeah, it's still floating around after step one because right. it's just leaving root leaves, right? It's just not really doing anything again until it can act as a base. Then we wanted to rewrite this as our as a skeletal structure just for the sake of practice. There's our final product plus HBR. All right, so now we know two mechanisms. We know SN1 and SN2. SM1 typically is more writing because you have to write it as two separate steps rather than just one step. But other than that, that's all there really is to these two mechanisms as far as writing the mechanisms. Now the trick becomes how do we know which is going to be more dominant at a certain under certain conditions? All right, so if we look at that mechanism, what can we say about the potential energies if we were just qualitatively putting something up there without trying to make it to scale or anything like that? Step where the leaving group leaves would be the lowest activation energy. Sorry. The lowest activation energy, so that would be the easiest step? Be the fastest step? Is that okay? Well, just think about your, we have an intermediate and that intermediate should be less stable than what we started with, right? Because we made a carbocation with an incomplete valence. Okay. So just surely from the fact that your transition state has to be higher than this, otherwise it's not a transition state. It's gotta be fairly uphill in energy to get to that first intermediate. And then in the last one, because there was that extra proton transfer step, it tech might actually look something like this, because we actually had a three-step reaction 
But when, once you have the carbyl cation, bringing your nucleophile in, it's pretty low barrier, right? And once you have that, your product just it's protonated when it shouldn't be, that's a pretty low barrier to get rid of that extra proton as long as you have something around to accept it. So if we're talking about a about the active carbon in terms of primary, secondary, tertiary, what do we expect to the, to see with the reaction rates? With the tertiary, the Fastest primary. with the tertiary, then ter secondary, then primary, and be slowest with the methyl. All right, so the exact inverse of SN2. SN2 gets faster the less stuff you have around because of the sterics. SN1 gets slower the fewer substitutions you have. It's faster the more substitutions you have, not because of the sterics, but because of the donating that electron density, that hyperconjugation that we talked about a little bit. Which, look at this slide first, and then there's a slide, or um, a slide in a second with that on hyperconjugation, there it is. So, factors that may affect SN1 reactions. Same factors as SN2 reactions to some extent, how good of a leaving group do you have? That still matters, right? In fact, it almost matters more in this case because we don't have something forcing the leaving group out. We need a leaving group that's good enough it'll leave on its own. So the other side of that is the more stable the carbocation we're going to make, the faster the reaction is going to happen. Should nucleophile strength, is that really going to affect anything about the rate? It has to be like, um, has to get to that point first. Or maybe right, maybe. It's, it's not going to affect the rate. It might affect the overall equilibrium constant. Because if you think about um, about this mechanism, once you get to this, this is our rate determining step, our slowest step is the first one, right? Once you get here, anything with a lone pair can be a nucleophile, right? Which means you could just wind up with the bromide coming right back and attaching itself right where it was, right? There is going to be some amount of the backward reaction. We don't usually draw that in the mechanism because we want our mechanism to go somewhere, not to go in circles. But that means that that how strong of a nucleophile you have relative to how good your leaving group is, is going to affect not necessarily the rate, but it will affect the equilibrium constant. Right, if your leaving group is a good leaving group, but it's also, but you also don't have a better nucleophile around, you can wind up with this being a non spontaneous reaction where this last step is higher in energy than where you started, in which case equilibrium would favor us staying here, right? So, make some of this, but those relative rates, those relative amounts are going to depend on how good of a nucleophile you have versus how good of a nucleophile is the leaving group. So, they compete kind of the leaving group. Exactly, exactly. Right, and that's why we wind up going back to this chart all the time, right? If, if um, the conjugate base of hydronium is water, right? If that's our nucleophile and it's a minus two and our leaving group is, say, this, this tough cell chloride group um, or this tosylate group, they're only different by pKa of one, right? means your K value is only going to be about 10. So you still might, might wind up with 90% of it being product, but 10% of it just staying as, as your original material. Versus if you have bromide as your leaving group, now we've got a difference of 10 to the 7 in terms of, um, in terms of your K value. Right, so the relative strengths of the nucleophiles does come into play. 
but it doesn't affect the rate. Then the last thing that we need to keep it in mind now that we didn't need to worry about with SN2 is the fact that if you make a carbocation as an intermediate, and it says a stable carbocation intermediate, it's, it's less stable than the product or the reactant, but it's stable enough that it's a potential energy minimum, which means there's a possibility for a rearrangement to happen. If your leaving group is on a carbon, is on a secondary carbon, say, that's adjacent to a tertiary carbon, we can make a more stable carbocation by shifting a hydrogen over. Right, and so we'll, if we look at, let's look at uh, this bottom reaction first. So if I specify which mechanism it is, then we don't need to worry about the fact that they're competing, right? It says just if it's a SN1 mechanism, ignore the fact that there might also be some SN2 product. So for this bottom one, if it's SN1, what is our intermediate going to look like? Bromine leaves, right? Well, now, so we have a secondary carbocation, which is okay. It can happen, um, but it's adjacent to a tertiary carbon. So if you have a carbocation intermediate that's adjacent to a more stable, something that would be a more stable carbocation, you wind up with a making a second intermediate step where the electrons from that carbon hydrogen bond just sort of get pulled over in that empty orbital because it's more stable to leave behind a positive charge on a tertiary carbon than a secondary carbon. then your nucleophile can come in. How come I no longer use the wedge? The hydrogen anymore, it's going to be planar too. It's SB2, it's planar. Because it's a carbocation, carbocations don't have that last part of the P orbital hybridized because they, there's no bond to be made yet, right? So they stay unhybridized or sp2. If they're sp2, they're flat. Which also means, well, okay, so let's finish this thought and then we'll go to the next, the next one. Um, I just have these out of order here. So then we're gonna, our final product, let me, Switch colors. It's going to be a methyl group and an NH2 attached to the same carbon. I just changed which carbon it was attached to for the sake of not running into the buttons over on the side. It's the same carbon that had the carbocation on it. I just spun the molecule. Does it matter which one's up and which one's down? Are we going to get any stereochemistry out of this molecule? They're on the same carbon, so there's no cis and trans. They're on, the methyl group and the NH2 have to be on opposite sides from each other, and both directions around the ring are identical. So there is no cis or trans or R or S for this one. Would you expect us to add the anthologia group to just like 
Yes, yeah, sorry. If we're writing out the mechanism, and this that's a good question also because um, the wording of the question is just what's the product. So a full credit answer on the test is just drawing this. Is just drawing drawing the one in black. You don't need to show the steps to get there. If it just says for the product, it says draw the mechanism. Now I'm actually looking for all of the individual arrows. Show me every bond breaking and forming in all the steps. With something like this, though, if you if it tells you it's an SN1 mechanism and you think there might be some rearrangement in there, it can be to your advantage to write out the mechanism so you can see what the intermediate looks like and if it's going to do a, a um, uh, rearrangement or and things like that. Um, however, you don't need to to get full credit on this question. Not a bad idea. <laughs> um, and then, and on the the next test, the tests that have like pages of reactions, you know, use the scratch paper too. You might want to keep it clean on your reaction sheet, but show your work. You don't necessarily want to run out of space. If there's 10 reactions on one page. You don't have room to write every mechanism the whole way out, right? Um, so make use of scratch paper for sure. Any questions on this first one? Makes sense. If you know to be looking for it, it's the first thing that you're going to forget to do realistically though, right? If you know your SN1 and SN2, the first thing you're going to forget is to check whether or not it can be a rearrangement. Um, so we but have, uh, SN2 wouldn't have a rearrangement because it's a single step. SN2 doesn't make a carbocation, right? It's instantaneous. Like, because it's instantaneous, because it's concerted, you don't get any rearrangement if it's SN2. Would it be the same product if it's SN2? There's no rearrangement. It can't be the same product, right? Yeah, so it would be. So what would the product be here for the second one if it was SN2? So we wind up putting our NH2 on the same carbon as has our leaving group. What about stereochemistry? Is it going to be cis or trans? started trans, but remember we have to attack from the from the other side of the molecule. So we're only going to get one stereoisomer. And it's going to be the cis stereoisomer if it goes SN2. So despite the fact that on the surface it looks like, oh, it's substitution, what does it matter if it's SN1 or SN2? You will get different products. Um, in cer certain circumstances. One is if there can be a rearrangement, or two is if you care about stereochemistry, then the mechanism is going to um, affect your answers. So if both mechanisms are possible for this reaction, then like if you want a certain product, how do you manipulate the conditions to allow it to happen? So one of the ways we do that, we're going to spend a lot of time on that, one of the ways we can do that is by um, either changing the strength of the nucleophile. A stronger nucleophile is going to favor SN2 because a strong nucleophile is strong enough that it can come in here and push bromine around and make bromine leave. But a weaker nucleophile might not be able to do that. So if we had NH3 as our nucleophile instead of NH2 with the negative charge, this is would give us the same product, but it's not as strong of a nucleophile. So it might be more likely to go through SN1. Um, you can also do things by changing the solvent because a, a carbocation intermediate is gonna be, is that gonna be more stable in a polar solvent or a non-polar solvent? Polar, right? If it's got a charge, right? So if it's going through a charged intermediate and we don't want it to do that, we can make that, we can change that potential energy surface so that instead of looking like that, it looks like this by putting it in a nonpolar solvent. 
because our non-polar solvent won't stabilize that carbocation intermediate the same way that say water might or any polar solvent might. So there are a couple of tricks. Solvent plays a role. Um, how strong your nucleophile plays is plays a role as far as determining which of the pathways it goes through. And realistically, though, you're almost always going to get some mixture of the two, especially if it's on a secondary carbon. If it's a primary carbon, it'll never go SM1 because you've got you're going to make a primary carbocation that's super unstable. And if it's tertiary, it's never going to go SN2 because it makes a stable carbocation and you have all those sterics slowing things down. Really, we get into the gray area with secondary carbons. So how about this top reaction here? If it's SN1, do we need to worry about any rearrangement? So let's look at our, our intermediate. Leaving group leaves. I mean, you could have a rearrangement, but if it rearranged to pull a hydrogen from over here, we would get something less stable than we started with. So that's not going to happen. And if it pulled one from over here, we would make something that's the same stability. So we go through an extra step for no additional bonus. So, I mean, in theory, you might have some of that. But if there's no driving force pushing it to do a rearrangement, usually you don't see a rearrangement. Not a measurable amount anyway. So then step two. So we bring in our hydroxide, right? That one's pretty painless. Do we need to worry about stereochemistry? Yes. Why not, Rob? There's no like uh, substitute substituents groups. There's no other substituents. Is that a chiral carbon? Yeah, there's a chlorine, propyl group, methyl group, and a hydrogen that's not drawn, right? Did we make a chiral carbon? So we do need to worry about stereochemistry to some extent because we made another asymmetric center. Is it going to favor one particular stereoisomer or is it going to be an even mix? You think it would favor one? If it has to like attack from the same direction. If it's SN2, it does. It's SN1 and it goes through that. What would, what did we just say about our carbocation intermediate in last, right? It was planar, which means that empty P orbital, that unhybridized P orbital sticks up and down. We have a planar molecule on that or a planar carbon, and the empty P orbital is sticking straight up and straight down in equal measure. So we have two targets. It can attack from a top or from the bottom because the leaving group is already out of the way. We're not stuck only attacking from the back door. We can go top or bottom. So that means we're going to wind up with both stereo isomers. Um, what's called the, we're going to make what's called the racemic mixture. Racemic mixture just means you're going to have an equal amount of R and S. We're making both of the possible stereo isomers. And Rough, and if it's the racemic mixture, that also implies that it's 50 50. You're not favoring one over the other. Occasionally, you can have cases where there's other sterics happening that, that do cause it to favor one side versus the other. For instance, if you had, if in our ring structure, yeah, our, our carbocation might be planar, but if there's a whole bunch of big isopropyl groups up here that are all on one side of the ring, that's going to favor the our nucleophile coming in from the other, just purely based on there's more room on the bottom of the ring than there is on the top of the ring. 
So there can be some cases where it doesn't give you the 50-50 mixture, but generally speaking, if we go through a carbocation intermediate, we call it, we lose all of our stereochemistry. We make a 50-50-ish mixture of both stereoisomers. So full credit answer for this reaction would either be to draw both of them Um, you can also, if you're paying attention, you just need to show me that you understand that you're going to get the racemic mixture. So you can also say, say, excuse me, R plus S. And just indicate it's not favoring one stereoisomer over the other. Did happen and then the, the public church about central carbon, um, would sterics still be a factor? Yeah. So, sterics or stereochemistry? Oh, stereochemistry. Um, so, rather than talk about a rearrangement, what if we just said, okay, our leaving group is on that carbon? There's no chiral center. Yeah. So, in this case, it doesn't matter. We wouldn't need to say R plus S because we're not going to, our intermediate one, it does, it starts with two identical ethyl groups attached. So you don't have four unique things attached. You don't have four unique things attached, then we're still going to go through an intermediate that looks like this. And then our final product looks like this, but it's still two identical ethyl groups that we can't tell the difference between. So with that in mind, yeah, no stereochemistry involved here. The simplest cases for SN1 and SN2 are really simple. Just when you start getting into the fringes of, of you know, what are the possibilities and where they start to overlap, that's when things get tricky. Any other questions on this page? All right, um, we'll go through a couple more slides and then we'll take our break. <clears throat> so I've already kind of been using this term, uh, but just to define it, nucleo nucleophilicity is how good of a nucleophile something is. Makes sense, right? Um, which is usually related to how good of a base something is, how good something is at pulling a proton off of, of another molecule, but not always. There can be cases where something is a good nucleophile, but, okay, so let's see. Yeah, you can have a good nucleophile that's not a strong base. And you can have something that's a good base, a strong base that's not a good nucleophile. That's more common, frankly. Um, but basically, yeah, anything with a negative charge is going to be a relatively strong nucleophile. Anything with a lone pair that's neutral can still be a nucleophile, but they're typically weaker nucleophiles. So that was the example on the on the last page. Where I said, okay, well, what if this, you know, if this was NH3 instead of NH2? That all of a sudden takes it from being a very strong base and a very strong nucleophile to being a okay base and a weak nucleophile. It's still got a long pair. You can still get to the same product that way, but it doesn't put give you so much driving force, which, as we mentioned, is going to factor into is it does it go SN1 or SN2? Weak nucleophiles, neutral nucleophiles, typically are much more likely to go SN1. Strong nucleophiles are much more likely to go um, SN2. This is another, when they're, they're generally related, generally if something is a good leaving group, it tends to not be as strong of a nucleophile as something that's 
a bad leaving group will almost always also be a, a strong nucleophile. But you can also have a good leaving group like our halides that can act as a nucleophile and they're relatively strong as nucleophiles as well. They're just not as strong as some of these others. But that's one of the ways that we have of making these alkyl halides in the first place is to have them act as a nucleophile. Um, usually not with a, a substitution reaction because we'd have to have a better leaving group than they are to favor an equilibrium, but we can still have them act as a nucleophile um, in, in, by tweaking the conditions or going through a different pathway. For instance, see there's um, a class of reactions when we get to alkenes called um, addition reactions, where where you basically break a pi bond and add something to each side. And in that case, you don't need something to be a better nucleophile. You're not competing nucleophiles. You just need something around that's got a negative charge to come in and supply an extra pair of electrons. So it's, we just haven't seen all of the reactions yet that'll make it clear how we make these or why we would consider these strong nucleophiles because for the most part, we're going to consider them as leaving groups more than as nucleophiles. Fluoride's not on there though. I mentioned we don't use fluoride that much, uh, but it's a very useful thing to consider in terms of it really shows us how solvent affects things. We can we talked about that a little bit already as far as stabilizing um, the intermediate if it goes SN1, but it also nucleophiles can be stabilized by solvents as well, right? Because if you have a if you have a strong nucleophile, but it's but it's surrounded by solvent molecules that are all very tightly attracted to it, that's going to make it harder for that to act as a nucleophile, right? Because it's, it's not making covalent bonds, but it's got its own steric things going on, right? And so fluorine is a really good example of that. Iodine and bromine and chlorine, you don't see that as much because they're so much bigger than, say, a like water molecule. Fluoride's about the same size as a water molecule. Um, if you have a if you have a, a solvent that can stabilize fluoride, but not too much. Us what are usually called apropolar, aprotic solvents. It's an aprotic solvent. What do you, what do you think that means? Doesn't favor protonation. Doesn't favor protonation. It's more, it's, um, more that it doesn't have an acidic proton on it. You can still have a polar solvent that doesn't have an acidic proton. Um, acetone is the classic example. As acetone has, uh, has a polar bond, carbon to oxygen is a polar bond, but it doesn't have any hydrogens attached to the oxygen. And that's what would make it a protic solvent. If it had a proton, it could relatively easily lose. The only protons acetone has are attached to a carbon. That's not a polar bond. Those aren't going to be easy to remove. If you have this around fluoride, well, there's still a partial positive at this end, so it's still going to stabilize the fluoride to some extent, but not nearly as strongly as if you put fluoride with a protic solvent where you get all of those hydrogen bonds can start to form with the fluoride and make really strong ion dipole interactions. So again, we, we will spend more time on solvent and how that affects things, but in general, I want you to be aware of this idea that aprotic solvents can still allow polar reactions to happen um, and dissolve, can still dissolve ionic compounds even, 
without stabilizing, particularly without stabilizing negative charges. This will still stabilize a positive charge just about as well as water will. But it won't stabilize a negative charge because you don't have that really strong hydrogen bond um, partial positive. You have sort of like a really diffuse partial positive. The whole bottom half of the molecule is a partial positive. Right. And so how that how that factors in, if we're in a non-polar solvent, SN2 reactions are typically pretty slow. Why would that be the case? SN2 reactions. Well, what does that tell us about our nucleophiles, right? Even weak nucleophiles still are polar, right? They still have to have a partial negative. And if we have to have, if we have a leaving group leaving, our leaving group that's leaving typically is going to be charged once it leaves, right? So in non-polar solvents, both SN1 and SN2 reactions are pretty slow because they both depend on either a charged intermediate or a charged leaving group or a charged transi transition state. And if you have all of those charges, non-polar solvents aren't gonna help very much, right? On the flip side, if we put a, a polar solvent, like water, then we don't have that issue, right? Because water can stabilize the reactants, it can stabilize the products, it can stabilize the intermediate. But if it stabilizes the reactants too much, or if in this case, if you have something that can act as a base and you put it with a protic solvent like water, then you get a side reaction happening, which effectively decreases your concentration of fluoride, right? Or if methoxide is our, as our nucleophile, we'd expect that to be a pretty strong nucleophile, right? But if you put it with water, you're going to have this equilibrium reaction happening. This is almost as good a base as hydroxide is. So you're going to have that competing reaction, which is going to effectively have the amount of, of nucleophile you have around. In the case of fluoride, fluoride is actually a significantly better base than water is. And so you would actually wind up with you know maybe only 1% of your fluoride is actually available as fluoride if you do this in a, in a protic solvent. So we can make our nucleophiles stronger if we do these. We need it to be in a polar solvent, but it can be in a polar a protic solvent. So like water do and that actually like stabilizes it. Well, part of it is that you can actually have this separate weak base reaction where you have water acting as an acid because this is not going to be nearly as strong as a nucleophile, right? It still can be a nucleophile because it's still got lone pairs and a partial negative, but it's not, it's going to be in the weak nucleophile category. And even if you don't have that happening, you can still, you basically surround these nucleophiles with water molecules that are all pretty tightly attached. So turns out that we don't actually ever just have things floating around by themselves, especially charged molecules. If you have fluoride with a negative charge in water, it's going to get surrounded by other water by water molecules. They're all going to basically point a partial positive at that, and it, and it winds up being a more or less octahedral shape, where they're not true covalent bonds. They're they're intermolecular forces, but those can still be pretty strong, especially ion dipole bonds, right? And so you you effectively tie up this fluoride because now there's no other space around it. You know, I'm not going to draw the other three, but basically it's surrounded by these water molecules. They're all fairly tightly bound to it. Um, 
if you had something like acetone instead, well, now acetone doesn't have one single place that is the most partial positive. It's got this whole side of the molecule that is kind of generally positive but not nearly as localized as a hydrogen. So even without something actually acting as a weak base, a protic, very polar solvent is gonna slow down a small charged nucleophile as opposed to a polar aprotic solvent, which will stabilize it to some extent, allow it to be dissolved, but not enough that it kind of gets in the way. Are these those London something forces? London dispersion forces are the ones that everything has. Those are the Van, Van der Waals forces. Our London dispersion forces are the same thing. Um, so those are the ones that we kind of ignore because everything always has them. Um, but that's how you get even non-polar molecules still have liquid in solid phases because they have some attractive force. It's just not very strong, not enough to hold it in that state at room temperature usually. Um, so I use the, the active carbon in leaving groups. Um, an analogy that I use sometimes is it's a little bit like um, that active carbon being in a relation, a person being in a relationship with someone else. Everybody has that friend that never breaks off one relationship until they've got the next one lined up, right? That's, I guess, N2. They're never really single on their own. It's always immediately they're going from one to the next, right? And then everybody has that friend that still prefers to be in a relationship, but is fine single for a while, right? That's SN1. This is like if your new potential relationship has a whole bunch of friends with benefits, that's going to slow down how likely that person is to form a new relationship, right? It's like a person too. Right. It's not a true covalent bond. If a covalent bond is relationship, then, then it's not a true relationship, but it's enough there that it's going to slow down actually getting to a real relationship, right? It's not a perfect analogy, but it's got enough character to it, enough flavor to it that it might make it stick in your head a little bit. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at 10 after, and we'll do some more practice with these.
What's that lab going on Tuesday? Uh, we're okay. Um, we spilled like a problem. We're back in the funnel and supposed to flow. Ah, uh, no, dude, that's uh, that happened to me too, actually. Yeah. Yeah, the first one we were doing with the, um, you know, was the butanol and everything. Yeah. And we spilled a little bit mm -hmm. and just made a mess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we we got a little bit of you like I said, I'm not calculated out. But there was like something measurable. So there you go. <laughs> at least we know like my field was worse. Yeah. Right now, but yeah, I haven't started writing it up yet. Yeah, my truck took a shit on me. Fuck. After I left the cop shop on Tuesday, mm -hmm. we wouldn't go into gear. Oh so, um, no, you couldn't make it back. Well, I linked it back home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I got from the cop shop to the um like Highway 50 mm -hmm. in El Tahoe, and it wouldn't go into first, it, it wouldn't go into reverse. It's automatic. Something. Yeah, it's a manual. Oh, manual. Yeah, it's a manual, five-speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wouldn't it's go good. into gear, and uh, I just think the clutch, is out, the clutch yeah. fluid needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. and then, yeah, the clutch is like seized or something. Yeah. Hopefully, it's just the fluid that needs to be changed, and then from there, yeah, that would have enough persuasion to <laughs> get yeah. it into gear. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that's why I didn't make it back. The truck was nothing. Yeah, I don't think it was much. I think like Nikki got like her installation wrapped up pretty fast. Yeah, she sent me all of her results, which was great. I didn't think she was gonna get it done, but that's cool. Yeah, she got it. Yeah, I was sitting there at the the intersection there, and the guy, the Cork and Moore, the dude driving the truck, the van around. Oh, yeah. I used to work with him actually at Sierra. Yeah, is it Chris? No, it's. Yeah. it's uh, Justin, I think his name is uh, Jay Glow. That's what we all call him. <laughs> I used to work with him over at Sierra. Yeah. And he towed me <laughs> from the intersection into the right end parking lot. Uh, so I could just mess with it a little bit and I was able to get it all the way home. That's cool. Yeah. So it's the first gear here. But... No, I actually was able to get into third. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, I didn't get past third. It likes the best of thirds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> third. Um, what cards I've had, you can like. Rev shift it, you know, and like it'll, if you just get in the right rev range, you just push it into gear without using the clutch, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be perfect. That's the way to get home if you need to without a clutch. But yeah, trucks it doesn't, trucks don't like it as much as cars do. Yeah, it's a 95 T100. Oh, so little Toyotas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. those things are beasts. It's pre OBD2, though. So I, I have a check engine, like I can't scan. <laughs> and I just gotta like, oh, there's no OBD port. Yeah, yeah there's no OBD1 port. Mm -hmm. But they don't make OBD one scanners for that anymore. Yeah, you can get something for your phone or whatever. <laughs> I tried with a couple of different things I got an adapter from OBD one to OBD two, and then OBD two port to that. Mm -hmm. It didn't read anything. And then I got an OBD one reader that went straight to my phone mm -hmm. and it still wouldn't read still anything. Work. Yeah, and then I cleaned it all out, made sure all the wires were good, and then took it to. Christmas was on. They said they couldn't read anything. So it was just a mess, you know? Yeah, I hate like electrical issues in cars. It's hard to like chase the shorts and stuff, you know? Yeah. Like, tight spots. Like my wife's got a mini goo, and like sometimes the left light turns on, sometimes it doesn't, you know? So it's like, hey, it's hard. I didn't figure out if you're a person. Once, heaven forbid you place an uh, incandescent bulb with an LED because then. Then everything goes all haywire. I think they are as well. They stock out. The stock out LED helps at least because, uh, in theory, at least they plan around that re different resistance. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. But like my my dash light, I replaced my old bulbs with it, with LEDs and new casings and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but now the uh, the brights indicator doesn't turn on. Mm -hmm. I can turn the brights on. I can turn them off, but it doesn't give me the little blue icon on the dashboard to tell me it's on. Is it's registered. It's a Toyota. Uh, it's a normal issue for its web. Just yeah. the bright light won't come on. Oh, yeah. okay. so I, I think it it corresponded to when I replaced them, but maybe yeah. it was just that that hooked up. Maybe it's not the LEDs. Maybe it's sort of the other thing. So I was going to put an LED in my motorcycle, and then I was bringing it alive, but like, uh, it's just so problematic because the wiring is not set for Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, you have to redesign the whole circuit, or you have to add your LED, which you, which you can do if you've had physics and you know what a capacitor or what a resistor is, is you can wire in a resistor next to, like, put it in parallel with your with your LED or series for 
um, as a way to kind of get around that, still get the LED without messing with the wiring, but then it's still not any more energy efficient, for, although you will burn your LED out, um, like you do for an incandescent, but yeah, they should redesign all the circuits anytime they do those. Um, yeah. But they don't it's always. So, especially Mini Cooper has a history, has a reputation for not thinking through <laughs> changing the thing, yeah. right? Yeah, it's like 20 some years old. So, yeah, there you go. It's like the first year that came out. <laughs> in my experience in the 2004 or older has a drive light issue, and in 2004 or newer has that has drive that light right. issue. <laughs> that would make sense. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's an older Toyota too. It's a 2007 with like 250,000 miles. So yeah, probably some of the dash lights are due to just plain out burn out yeah, yeah. as well. And if I also tied that to putting in LEDs, I could have fried it by giving it too much current. <laughs> yep. All right. Let's talk a little bit more about solvent. This is kind of just explaining the same thing that we just showed. Um, any polar solvent is going to have chrome pairs. So any polar solvent, protic or not, is going to be able to stabilize positive charges. Um, which, for better or worse, if it's a protic solvent, it's going to also stabilize negative charges very strongly. Because remember those how hy hydrogen bonds work in terms of uh, intermolecular forces. So when you have something electronegative attached to a hydrogen, hydrogen has only has two electrons, right? Um, it doesn't have any core electrons that kind of are going to sort of stay wrapped around that nucleus. So if you attach a hydrogen directly to an oxygen or a nitrogen or a chlorine or chlorine, you get this very, very extreme polar bond with a very, very strong partial positive that's centered directly on the hydrogen. So because hydrogens don't have any core electrons, because they only have the electrons that are in the bond, protic solvents stabilize negative charges more than positive charges. They're asymmetric. Seems like with everything balancing out, seems like it should average out to be the same, but it's not because of those, those 1s electrons being in the bond, the bonding for hydrogen. Right. And so what you see so when we look at the potential energy surfaces, is kind of what I was showing earlier, but more cleanly, is if you're in a less polar solvent. So first off, is this going to be, um, would we expect to see a potential energy surface like this for SN1 or SN2? SN. We're going to have to keep each other on top of that. Um, the multi-step by making the, the having the intermediate is what we're showing here, right? Um, and both cases are going to be more stable in a solvent than they are in gas phase, right? We always compare anything that's happening in a solid or in a, a liquid phase or in a solution. We can always compare that to our, our true neutral would be a gas phase reaction, right? Gas phase reactions for anything charged are going to be super rare, right? Because you have to have a whole bunch of energy to be able to put something with a charge into the gas phase because you have no stabilization now. Um, so either of these is going to be better than gas phase. Um, but the more polar the, the solvent is, the more you're going to stabilize sort of everything. You're going to stabilize your transition states. You're going to stabilize your intermediates. You're going to stabilize your products and your reactants. Um, this one, this is from a different textbook. So it uses slightly different nomenclature. It has L for leaving group instead of X. Um, same, same basic idea here, right? And delta G for the transition state is drops by more than these are stabilized. So a more polar solvent is generally going to speed up, especially SN1 reactions, but also SN2, because we do still have those charges in the transition states. 
um, that are going to be more stabilized than a more polar solvent. And the caveat to this is, as soon as we introduce a protic polar solvent though, which are the most polar solvents, are protic polar solvents because you get those super strong hydrogen interactions. Um, then all of a sudden that introduces a different variable because you make your nucleophiles less nucleophilic by having, by having a protic solvent. So we want to stabilize reactants in transition states with polar solvents, but we don't want to stabilize, especially the reactants, we don't want to stabilize them by too much. Stabilizing the products too much can actually be a positive thing because if it actually do have like an, a weak acid base reaction happening with your product, that actually is a good thing because then we're removing product as we're making it. We can actually drive, that's using Le Chatelier's principle, we can drive it further to equilibrium by doing that, right? Um, but we definitely don't want to do that with the reactants. So we have to be careful, depending on what nucleophiles we're using, what reactants we're using, can change what solvent we use. And especially if we're trying to favor one mechanism over another. Right, so if it's an SN2 reaction, we can wind up with a situation like this where the transition state isn't necessarily that stabilized that much, right? Because we didn't have any true charges in our transition state. The whole thing was charged, but it was kind of spread over the whole molecule. And even if we had a charged nucleophile, it wasn't really, um, it was in the process of making a new bond at the time, right? And so that sort of delocalizes that negative charge, and makes everything a little bit more stable. So with SN2, stabilizing the nucleophile can have a dramatic impact on the rate because you're not changing this by that much. We're changing how stable the reactants are relative to that transition state. So is the less polar solvent we get? So the less polar solvent is in red. By stabilizing, by having a polar protic solvent, we're stabilizing the reactants a lot, and we're not changing how much we're stabilizing the inter. There is no intermediate, so we're um, stabilizing the transition state. Yeah, it's a little bit lower in energy. More polar solvent is a little bit um, lower relative to without that polar solvent, but it's still way higher relative to where you started. All right, so here's the slide on protic solvents. So here's the most common aprotic solvents. Acetone is my go-to example because it's fast and easy to draw. Um, but you also see things like dimethylformamide or DMSO, which is dimethyl sulfoxide, which is effectively acetone, except you replace that carbon in the score. Um, acetonitrile, hexamethylphosphoramide, phosphoramide. Um, that one's less common. I've done reactions with all of the others, but I haven't done reactions with HMPA. Um, I probably would have if I'd gone into synthetic chemistry or spent a lot more time in an chem lab in grad school, but it tends to be a little bit more specialized. Um, but in, in this case, so the protic solvents stabilize everything, and sometimes the reactants and nucleophiles more than the transition state. Polar aprotic solvents stabilize transition states, but they don't stabilize the nucleophiles. All right, so, and again, here's an example, stabilizing, it doesn't really make a difference whether it's protic or not when it comes to stabilizing a positive charge. But when it comes to stabilizing a negative charge, you can't get nearly as strong of an interaction. And that can be, that can, sterics can factor into this as well. And really there's, um, there's actually a sort of a scale for help for um, evaluating 
objectively how polar a solvent is. They call it the dielectric constant, which is effectively just you know how big is the partial positive and the partial negative? What's the electron density look like on this molecule? Um, what's the biggest difference between electron density between the partial negative and the partial positive? Um, but it doesn't take into account things like is it a protic solvent or not? And so that winds up sort of being its own variable here. So here's another good table. Um, and with the relative rates, this is relative rate in methanol in DMF versus in DMF, which is an aprotic solvent, polar aprotic solvent. So bromide goes from being one to 21,000 times faster if you do it in DMF. This is specifically for SN2. Um, and even, the, but the larger you go, the less it matters. So iodine is much faster nucleophile, much better nucleophile in methanol than bromine is, but the effect of switching it to DMF is pretty small, relatively small. It's only 150 times faster instead of 21,000 times faster because it's physically a larger object, but it still not doesn't have enough room to have extra interactions. And so, so the methanol, the protic solvent doesn't stabilize it as much as it does things that are smaller. So in methanol, the difference between, look at the difference between these, these two in the same solvent, even though fluoride, we would expect it to be a better nucleophile than ionine, right? Normally. Um, because it's smaller, it, it can better attack and form stronger bonds. It's a worse leaving group than iodine. But in a protic solvent, it's also a worse nucleophile. By a factor of, what is that? By you know, 10 to the 5, 100,000 times slower in methanol. Versus in a a protic solvent, it's actually a pretty good nucleophile. That's more what we would expect based just purely on the size and how strong a carbon chlorine bond is relative to a carbon iodine bond. This is matter matches more what we would expect to see. So that does it just goes to show that the, the solvent that we choose has a big role, especially with certain nucleophiles that can act as a weak base. You have a nucleophile that can act as a weak base and pull on accept a proton, then the protic solvent is really going to mess with things because you're going to have that side reaction happening the whole time. Eighty-two million times faster. That's pretty impressive. Although you put that in scientific notation, and okay, eight point two times ten to the six, times ten to the seven is still a big number. But it's like, oh, we've seen bigger equilibrium constants, right? And rate constants. Um, so in general, we're going to usually be referring to things relative to each other in the same solvent, regardless of what it is. And this is the one thing that the, the pKa table specifically is talking about in a protic solvent, right? Because a pKa table is specifically ranking things according to how well they give away a proton to water, right? And so our pKa tables don't take this into effect or this effect into account, I should say. All right, so in general, here's our general rule. The strongest base will also be the strongest nucleophile unless the reaction happens in a protic solvent and the bases differ in size. So fluoride is a better base than the rest of the halides. But if you're in a protic solvent, fluoride is the worst nucleophile 
because it's the better base. All right, so, but if both of these things are true, if it's the same, if they're the same size, then it doesn't really make a difference whether you're in a protic solvent or not. The better base is still going to be the better, the better nucleophile if they're the same size. Because so what's what is would be the same size as fluoride that would be a stronger base that can you think of? Same size, meaning not molecular weight, but energy levels. So it's in the same row of periodic table. It could be a base. Yeah. Ammonia, oxygen, hydroxide would work too, right? So if we're comparing fluoride to hydroxide to amide is the name of that as a polyatomic ion. Ammonium is NH4 with a plus, ammonia is neutral, amide is when it's negative. These are all the same size, relatively speaking. So yeah, they're all gonna be affected by a protic solvents, but they're all gonna be affected equally by a protic solvent. So we could still say, okay, well, amide is a stronger base, therefore it's a stronger nucleophile. It's only when you start changing rows on the periodic table that you wind up having, having the steric effects not be evenly distributed, or sorry, the um, solvent effects not be equally distributed. Right, so when these two conditions are met, your pKa table goes out the window. I mean, kind of, it's still relevant, but it's not going to be as easy to understand. If you're in a protic solvent, the larger bases are better bases. And you're in an aprotic solvent, the smaller bases are better bases. All right, let's do some practice. So for starters, we don't need to worry about solvent effects or anything like that or strength of the base. It just says, what is the product? If it goes through an SN2, what's the product? And then it says, our products are reactants favored. That's when it, we look at how strong uh, of a base we have or how strong the nucleophile. 
jump backward for a second to remind ourselves of the, the criteria. The strongest base will also be the strongest nucleophile unless it occurs in a protic solvent and their different sizes. If it occurs in a protic solvent and they differ by size, then it's flipped. Be better if it's protic and they differ in size. They're or a stronger nucleophile, the bigger they are. So for this first one, aprotic solvents mean we don't need to worry about that. Basically, aprotic solvents mean that solvent effects don't, aren't going to change the way we think about things. So for these first two, Again, I don't necessarily expect you to know um, what these mean off the top of your head yet. <laughs> um, but they're usually written if, if the solvent is going to play a role in things or if we want to specify what the solvent is, we typically write it as though it's a catalyst. It's not necessarily catalyzing anything, but that's sort of like the way that we write down the reaction conditions, the relevant reaction conditions if we're trying to specify something, is to just put it above or below the arrow. Um, so in this case, a protic solvent means stronger base is a better leaving group, or stronger base is also the stronger nucleophile. The weaker base is the better leaving group. So we would favor the product side pretty strongly. If we look at the difference here. Yeah, it's not as big of as strong of a nucleophile as a mite is, but it's still 10 to the 18 times. We would expect K for this reaction to be about 10 to the 18. So favoring the reactor, the product pretty strongly. <clears throat> if we did this, it would be overkill, but if we did this with amide as our as our nucleophile. Then we're talking about an equilibrium constant of 10 to the 47 favoring the reactants. So really, really overkill. And then the thing to keep in mind is if it's SN2, we get the same, keep our stereochemistry, but inverted, right? Because our nucleophile comes in and attaches the isostrut this way from the top, from the opposite side. All right, so here, same thing. Our leaving, as far as the stereochemistry goes, fluoride is going to come in and attack from the opposite side as the bromine, and the bromine's leaving. In an aprotic solvent, we can still say, okay, well, fluoride is the better base because hydrochloric acid is the weaker acid. So we would still favor the products here. We have fluoride acting as a nucleophile and doing a pretty good job of it as long as we're in an aprotic solvent. If we do this in a protic solvent, that's going to muddy the waters a bit. Ammonia is pretty well stabilized in water. And so we would actually expect our, our larger molecule, our larger nucleophile winds up being the stronger nucleophile in most cases. This is a, a, enough of an extreme difference that it's not going to be like it, these are totally flipped necessarily, um, where it's going to favor the reactants by 10 to the 18. It's more like it's going to be closer to even. It's going to, it might even still favor the products a little bit, but not by 10 to the 18. <clears throat> a better question probably would have been if I had replaced this with fluoride. Because now they're a lot closer in in um, base strength than they were 
and fluoride in particular is a pretty strong, um, is a pretty strong, okay, or it's not as, I guess it is, hang on there. So that is, that is a stronger base than fluoride. So I guess, yeah, that does flip it. It does work the way it's written. Um, in general, I'm not going to be trying to ask you trick questions on a test. It'd be more like, you know, here's a difference in react in in K values for these two reactions based on on different solvents. Can you explain that? And rather than asking you to come up off the top of your head, because if your pKa table doesn't apply, then what are you supposed to do, right? Make up numbers, basically. Um, and so it'd be more likely that I would give you the numbers than ask you to explain them. Any questions on, on these ones? That's the same slide we already looked at. These are all the same. Ah. I copy and paste the slides in the middle of the device. All right. Yeah, these are the same ones we already did, aren't they? Um, I don't know how I managed to do that. Well, I think we're probably going to end a little bit early today, not just because I do the slides, but because that's most of what I wanted to go over today. Um, so this weekend will be a quiz like normal. Um, just be some some practice problems. If it goes through SN1, what are your products? If it goes through SN2, what are your products? Um, and we're not going to get into you deciding which is which necessarily, unless it's pretty obvious. Um, like if I gave, if it's tertiary or, or primary, I, you know, I might have you uh, explain that or predict what the product is in those cases. Um, but in general, for now, I'll tell you the mechanism. All right. It's a pleasant change from me going five, 10 minutes over.